Um, welcome to parallel session 7B, Exploring and Designing the Future. Our uh, moderator today will be Mr. Paul Gerritsen, and we will have as uh, speakers um, Ken Kate, that David Hammers, Jutta Interleitner, Tom uh, Benhoven, and Robert Gies. Um, just a reminder, uh, a couple of uh, rules stump. Uh, maybe you have uh, uh, already uh, being familiarized with the platform in the, couple, in the previous days, but just, uh, just as a reminder, please uh, leave your comments in the chat, verify the poll section. Uh, you who is attending in the people tab, leave your questions in the Q&A tab and uh, maximize your screen by hiding uh, the navigation panel uh, with this uh, arrow on your uh, top uh, right and, the, and uh, this square button on your button uh, right as well. Uh, bear in mind that this uh, uh, meeting will be recorded and all recordings will be made available after the conference. Um, after the session, uh, please check the event chat, polls and people and Q&A tabs to discover the uh, coming sessions, uh, try the networking function and uh, liaise directly with other participants by sending direct messages. I will now uh, leave the floor to our moderator, Paul. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, um, for uh, opening the session uh, with the practical notes. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit past uh, 11.30, Friday 11th of June. No better moment, of course, uh, to explore the future. Uh, like always, I, I could almost add, um, we are here to do that, to, uh, just that, learning um, from techniques planning for the future, um, learning from its successes and its failures, uh, how to get ahead, how to not to get ahead too far, leaving everybody behind and everything in sort of splendid isolation, thinking about the future. So how can it be effective uh, thinking about the future and exploring that? And of course, I don't need to iterate on that. It, it's very much necessary to do it and it's increasingly uh, complex in its nature by a growing number of specialists we need to involve from different domains and also allowing for um, the co-creation with the real stakeholders people living and working in certain areas how how do we get them on board as well uh, today we present a lineup of various different approaches on different skill levels and with different abstractions uh, we have from uh, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency PBL David Hamers, uh, Deputy Head of the Department of Spatial Planning and Quality of the Environment. Uh, he will present um, a new scenario study approach. Marije Tenkate, whom you might have already seen uh, in the, the program uh, on Wednesday, I believe, Head Urban Planner of the City of Rotterdam. Uh, she will present the multiple dimensions that are being taken into account uh, in planning for the future of the city. And Jutta Hinterleitner, um, is also present and presenting uh, until recently she was the director of the research by design studio of the royal institute of dutch architect and uh, researcher at tu delft currently she's working uh, for the creative industry fund and she's setting up a, a quite focused research by design program um, so scaling up um, and she will be showcasing the city of the future uh, research by design uh, and then in the in the panel conversation we will have uh, Tom Vanhoeven, architect, urbanist, former state advisor, um, or maybe you always are a state advisor once you entered into that domain. Why not? Uh, and a lecturer, and of course a little bit partner in crime. Also uh, present in the panel will be Robert Huis, uh, as said, uh, with his uh, new office, Tech Architects, notable upcoming office. Um, and um, well, let's see where uh, where it leads us. My name is Paul Geertz, by the way. I'm director of the Delft Metropolis Association Think Tank for Metropolitan Development in the Netherlands and also a little bit across the borders. Um, and of course, it's very interesting to have this discussion. Um, it's one of the perks of living in a very small country that we know each other very well and work together often uh, in a wide variety of modes and, and projects. But the problem is also a little bit that you, that you start to believe in your own 
I'm sorry too much. So please, please use the chat for your comments and insights. Um, and um, we would particularly like to have um, an interesting debate. And I might even uh, get you on stage uh, to come up with your uh, moments of reflection. So please use the chat so that it will be visible for me uh, that, uh, that you have a remark. Uh, but I would like to start with a poll. Uh, maybe that would work. Um, I think you should uh, see it by now. Do you consider yourself in your work to be a designer of the future? I'm curious who's in the who's in the hall. Uh, yes, or sometimes. Well, we don't have that many participants. Uh, let's see. Well, wait a little bit. For more people to find the, the the poll, well, of course, this open question can only lead to either an answer of of yes, um, which will most people say they they are considering the, themselves to be a designer of the future, or sometimes, uh, however small that might be, um, we are all busy with the future. Nobody's uh, is objecting to that. Um, so, um, without further ado, I would like to uh, ask on stage um, David Hamers. Uh, he will introduce to us uh, his recent research by, uh, or his recent research uh, on the, uh, in, the, in, in finding a new scenario study approach. And uh, he will present to us. So, please, uh, David. Um, Take the floor. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thanks for the invitation uh, by the organization to uh, share my thoughts with you. I will share my screen now. Hopefully that works. And hopefully you can hear me as well. Just checking if that is the case. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah, hopefully you see the uh, the uh, slide now. Um, if not, Paul, could you give me a hint? Because I don't have any feedback. If, if, it, if you remain silent, I'll just proceed. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, David Hamers. I'm a, a senior researcher at uh, PBL, uh, Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And perhaps it's good to briefly tell you a little bit about this institution, because some of you may not know it, um, or maybe a lot of you may not know it, I'm not sure. We are a uh, national knowledge institute for uh, strategic policy analysis, which means that we are a scientific body, uh, part of the national government of the Netherlands, but also with an independent position within that government. So we can also be very critical uh, of our government, which is perhaps internationally uh, a, quite a unique position to be in as a knowledge institute that is part of national government. I'll not go into this uh, now, but perhaps we could highlight a little bit uh, um, about the, a little bit more to tell you a little bit more uh, about this later. Um, rehearsing the future is, I think, uh, a new or yeah, quite quite a new approach to embracing uncertainty. I have uh, I've called it in this slide. Um, we have made uh, long-term scenarios for urban and infrastructure de uh, development. And currently, we are also elaborating uh, on this method in uh, a, a, a wide variety of fields. So perhaps I can tell you a little bit about that later. But first, what is rehearsing the future? What we did was, last couple of years, develop a, a method, uh, a scenario making method, and also a, um, a scenario application method in practice. It's good to add that, I think. Um, to deal with uncertainty in the field of urban and, and infrastructure policy making. I will just briefly highlight some of the aspects of this method. I will not go into detail because I only have 15 minutes. Um, you can read all about it if you want to know more. There are Dutch publications and there are also English publications available. And I will show you the, uh, the website addresses in my final slide. So I will skip a lot, but you can read if you want to know more. And what you see here in moving in the screen currently is uh, four films that we made, short animated movies, that you can also find on our website. I will not show you these uh, films uh, 
now because we don't have the time for that. If you are interested in seeing them, just visit the website. Okay, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about why we did the research, how we did the research, what the, well, very briefly, the content of the four future scenarios is, and also how we applied it in policy practice, policy and planning practice. So I'll guide you through it, through the, uh, the presentation. First, the why and the how. Um, doing our homework, so that means a lot of reading, a lot of interviewing experts, um, uh, scanning the media, et cetera, et cetera. What we discovered is, and also in the scientific literature, uh, we found this notion of deep uncertainty. Um, you all know about the transitions we are currently in, climate change, uh, energy uh, systems should change, a circular economy, an agricultural transition towards a different food system, rapid technological developments, social upheaval, a changing relationship between the government, market parties and citizens. There's a lot of things going on currently. And if you add that up, so I'm not going to again elaborate on this, but if you add this up in, in the literature, this is called deep uncertainty, which is a form of uncertainty that is much more than just changing things a little bit or optimizing within a certain system. Uh, we think that the system should change on a, on a variety of topics and levels. And to deal with this um, degree of uncertainty, we think scenario making uh, can be a, a fruitful tool, a useful tool to, well, recognize uncertainty, analyze it, reflect on it, which is a completely different attitude than ignoring uncertainty. And I'm, I understand that policymakers have uh, quite some difficulties with embracing uncertainty and so they are, they are called upon to act uh, of course but i think in able to, to be able to act uh, properly one should deal with uncertainty and not uh, brush it aside so what we were aiming for with the scenario making method as a tool is to anticipate developments and also also in a quite a, a, an early stage of policy making or planning to explore strategic courses of action well, most of you, I think, are familiar with scenario making. So this um, uh, hopefully um, uh, makes sense at this uh, more basic level. So what we did was we made a long-term scenario, uh, um, four, four of them eventually, 30 years ahead. We started in 2019, hence 2049, uh, 49, which would now be 51. Um, a qualitative study, exploratory, um, so just a little bit of, of, of numbers in them, mostly qualitative. We were looking for consistent scenarios. They should be convincing, so not too wild and not inconsistent because people will then uh, ignore the scenarios, I'm afraid. And they should each be distinctive. So you should really be able to distinguish four, in our case, different futures in, in the Netherlands. And very important, to mention is we were aiming to be a little bit provocative. So we worked with four normative futures. Let's 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 summarize this as four um, different flavors, cultural flavors, value-laden flavors of the Netherlands in the future. What do we want? Multiple, so in the plural, uh, normative future versions of the Netherlands. I will tell you more about this. We did not use a, a classic two axis, four quadrant uh, approach. We used what is called in the literature a morphological scenario approach, which enabled us to uh, work with multiple dimensions instead of two, just two axes. Um, to summarize this again very briefly, um, five govern governance slides. So uh, who are the main actors? Three sustainability slides in this mixing panel, uh, people, planet, profit, with three P's of sustainability. And three slides about what kind of society do we want to be or what kind of uh, image have, do we have of human beings? Should they be perfect? Can they, can they also fail? Should they be, become robots or, well, questions like that. And also our attitude towards technology. Um, we use this, this panel and as a metaphor and also very practical, practical hands-on to, to, um, to develop 
four types of settings for four types of future versions of the Netherlands. And we did this uh, with a, um, a, th a theoretical approach coming from uh, anthropology by Mary Douglas in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s already, I think 70s already, and then developed in political theory a little bit more, um, which again, I'm not going to summarize this because it would take a lecture in itself, but which allowed us to um, create different coalitions of cultural streams in the Netherlands to construct, help construct four versions of the Netherlands with different, let's say, different value systems. I will make this very concrete in a few slides. So that allowed us to um, make four settings of this mixing panel that you see here. You see the slide uh, positions uh, in, in four different um, combinations. And this is the backbone for the four scenarios. We use this to flesh out with all kinds of iterative, um, interactive uh, methods of working to flesh out what will the city look like? Could the city look like, I should say? What kind of mobility patterns uh, fit with this version of the Netherlands? Uh, who's in charge? What kind of business models do we have? What kind of uh, traffic, um, uh, automated vehicles or bicycles or trains or whatever? So um, we, in, in, in the plural again, we uh, constructed uh, a lot of elements. We used a lot of elements to construct uh, four futures. So these are the four futures, and I will just highlight some of the key aspects of all of them. So first, with the first, the first on the left here is Bubble City. Bubble City is a future version of the Netherlands um, in which digital bubbles are dominant. The digital is more important than the physical. I just highlighted some of the uh, key aspects uh, with a bold typeface here. And it's also a very fragmented society. So you will encounter people within your bu bubble, but not necessarily people outside of your bubble. And uh, government has a rather small role in this because people and, and small businesses inside their own bubble e ecosystem, if you like, they are in charge uh, more or less of this version of the Netherlands. What does the uh, urban structure uh, look, look like in this future? Well, geography becomes much less important than currently. You see a lot of dynamics in outdated real estate, which, which means that uh, what is perhaps uh, ugly and a quite a derelict version of the city or uh, derelict uh, places in the city, they will re be reprogrammed again and again by means of, uh, let's say, virtual reality, augmented reality. So this digital layer becomes dominant much more than what we are now used to, the, still the physical backbone of the city. So spatial planning in this case will also be very much about temporality. I think Maria Tenkate will uh, tell us a little bit more about this also just uh, in, in a few moments. And in terms of infrastructure and transport, less physical movements because of digital connections and high level of accessibility, but only as long as you have digital skills. So people that lack these skills or do not want to be part of the digital, they do have a problem in this version of the Netherlands. The second scenario is state of green. This is a top-down green system transition. Um, top-down, so EU and the national government of the Netherlands take the lead. In our scenario story, this was pressured by society. Just think of the Dutch people in the audience. Just think of the Urgenda uh, law suits uh, and, and the one uh, against Shell just last week. Society pressures government to act. And, and in this case, in this scenario, government says, OK, we will act. We will come up with a top-down green system transition. We will opt for planet first and not profit first which means a better living environment in a lot of respects, but also less freedom of choice. This is quite a strict green system, if you want it or not, as a city. Oh, that was a bird bumping into the, the glass here, <laughs> which made me, okay, that was a little bit scary. Sorry about that. The urban structure in this, um, in this case, in the state of green, optimal use of the existing urban structure. So do not build 
anything new if it's not necessary because you want to uh, be uh, sensible in terms of, for example, resources and also um, energy emissions, energy use and emissions, and a lot of transit-oriented development. Um, transit first and also walking and cycling first and only if that is not possible, public tra uh, car travel, um, air travel is reduced strongly in this case. And for example, self-driving technology in this scenario is not used for private transport. That is the main debate or the main, uh, also by, by tech companies, the main story. Uh, the, the very flashy self-driving car for private use. In this case, it's used for public transport, which is, I think, a different take on how we also could use or develop self-driving technology. The third one is marketplace, business-oriented, performance, success, self-reliance as main values, um, and government facilitates businesses. So government is not absent, but creates a stable investment climate, let's say, in which businesses can thrive, mainly big businesses, they are in charge, uh, which leads in this case to quite big socio-economic contrasts. This obviously has a quite liberal or even neoliberal flavor, this uh, scenario. The urban structure in this case is much more about central business districts, strong centers, luxury campuses, very pleasant neighborhoods, neighborhoods for, for people who can afford that. If you cannot afford it, you will be uh, perhaps living in, uh, in neighborhoods that are lagging behind in economic terms, but also in terms of quality of the living environment and, and public space design. And or you will be living in some distant suburbs, which means that you will commute uh, long and you will have long commuting time. Um, in this case, just to highlight one, self-driving cars are uh, appear on the scene on a large scale. Um, they get exclusive infrastructure, they get the priority. Um, and what, what is new in, radically new in the Netherlands, in, in this scenario, these will be privatized, priced roads, uh, to allow commuters to, uh, to speed up their, their journeys. Quite different from, let's say, state of green just now. And the last one, um, our neighborhood is a, future of the Netherlands in which the, the own neighborhood, one's own neighborhood, and also one's own region are the center of daily life. It's much more small scale. You are proud of where you come from. That is kind of who you are as well. It's, it's, it's a much more rooted scenario, community-driven scenario, which means, for example, that supra-local coordination is very difficult because no one is really interested in the supra-local or national or international connections, for example. Quite a different uh, situation if you compare it to the current state in the Netherlands. But also we think a trend that we picked up that could develop in the, uh, in the near future and in, in, in the more distant future. So the small scale is important uh, that I already mentioned. Um, the, the urban structure is typically a, a medium sized cities, uh, suburbs and villages, kind of a little bit spread out in the Netherlands and quite different from the agglomeration driven, the big agglomeration, for example, in uh, the marketplace scenario. People will share homes with their families. You want to be near each other in this uh, scenario. The quality of the environment is much more important than, for example, traveling far or fast. It's enough what you find in your region. Uh, a lower paced society, let's say. Um, and the local and regional infrastructures are well maintained. National and international infrastructures are more or less neglected. Um, this is quite different, uh, as I said, uh, because Dutch government, national government, is very proud of its national and, and sh should be, I think, very proud of its national infrastructural system. In this case, this will change. People will primarily look for a quality in their own region. So let's share with you my last slide. Uh, we did not end with publishing these scenarios, and I will show you the publications uh, in Dutch and in English, because we thought if we, we, we if we stop there, people will perhaps read it and then go back to business as usual, and that we did not want to uh, to happen. So we took the initiative to go on tour. 
uh, we, 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 we made a road trip throughout the Netherlands. Um, we just posted it, who wants to invite us? So we'll come, uh, we'll, we'll, come we'll, we'll head in your direction. And a lot of organizations responded. Uh, we were very, very uh, happy about that. National government departments uh, of, of different, uh, different kinds, um, big companies, uh, municipalities, uh, provinces, um, all kinds of kind of network organizations. And what we did, we took the scenarios uh, with us and we use them in a uh, workshop format or different formats to um, help these organizations answer questions that they shared with us. So we, we the, the starting point was their own questions and we offered our scenarios to kind of challenge them to uh, perhaps change the question a little, little bit or perhaps to come up with new answers, new answers to their questions. Um, these three types of questions could be answered, um, and there's a lot of sub-questions, but I will not uh, uh, mention them uh, now because I want to finish now. Um, what could urban regions look like in different futures? So we challenge people to have a, from the future back into the now, what could your region, for example, look like? Um, this is very close to classic scenario making, I think. But also, do the scenario shed a new light on current policy issues? That is a little bit more distant from classic scenario making because sometimes scenarios uh, remain quite distant and quite detached from the current policy issues that policymakers and planners are struggling with, which makes it difficult for them to adapt, uh, adopt, or apply scenarios. So we try to come back to the current situation and shed a new light on uh, questions that they were struggling with currently. And the third one is, are there new issues and challenges that perhaps were a blind spot in current policy uh, and plan, policy making and planned trajectories? And do new things come into view? Do you gain a completely new perspective on what you would, were thinking that would happen? Um, could you develop robust uh, answers or become adaptable if things um, uh, turn out differently than you would have expected, stuff like that. And in the background, you see some yeah, um, results, people around the table, a live session, a map, we make posters, we made drawings, we, we did slogans, we did all kinds of things, just as a as kind of a, a use all these, these different media to really get into touch with uh, people and tap into their creativity and help them a little bit to cross this barrier from the now to the long-term uh, issues that we should be dealing with as a society. So this was my presentation. If you want to know more, because I skipped a lot of things, I'm sorry about that. 15 minutes is 15 minutes. You can read more on the website. Rehearsing the Future is the English version that you can download for free and the Oefenen met de Toekomst is the Dutch version. And the third one is a in-depth uh, background study in which we explain how we did things uh, more on the method and the literature, etc. If you uh, have difficulty to just now write these uh, URLs down, you can just email me as well. So thanks for your attention and um, I will leave the floor yeah uh, thanks very much for your uh, for your presentation uh, i also posted one of the links to the english version of the document uh, directly in the chat so uh, no doubt people can find our way from there um very much not much happening in the chat as yet not direct questions but perhaps they are there so please write them down in the chat and we can pick them up later we will do a little bit of reflection after maria has uh, presented with the two of you. So let's see if, uh, if uh, some issues can come up. Uh, but for now, thank you very much. And I would like to uh, invite uh, Marije ten Kate um, to the floor. Um, I hope Hi there. To... Yes, great. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'll share my screen. Whoa. 
This one's not good. Yes, I think this works. And if not, I would like to hear it. I can't see. Hi, my, na my name is Marije ten Kate. I'm a head urban planner at the municipality of Rotterdam. Uh, and I would like to tell you a bit more about how we're dealing with um, uh, the cyber uh, uh, things that uh, uh, David also was talking about. I'm dealing as a uh, urban planner a lot with urban growth. Uh, diverse and new space claims are coming to the city. Um, you know, probably we, there's a lot of uh, need for more housing. And in Rotterdam, we estimate it, we have to build at least 50,000 new dwellings. It means also you have to add some more things like uh, education, uh, care, uh, culture, sports and green, or more on the commercial side, offices, brownfields, uh, extra uh, logistics services, uh, leisure, mobility. Um, and if you add this all up, it's more than the available space within the boundaries of Rotterdam. And there's a third category we call transitions. And these ones, you cannot just estimate very well how much space you need, but they do uh, create new space claims. And how are we going to do that? Because it's really hard to uh, anticipate. And we were wondering how we could use cyber. Cyber in the city. Cyber is not just, uh, no, no longer just in the cloud. I would like to tell you a bit about that's how we deal with it in Rotterdam. Because the city changes by digitization, we call it Zap City. And we could use it also to deal with the space claims. We see social use patterns really changing. They're less space dependent and more temporary. So these boys here in their uh, favorite pub, um, they might uh, uh, meet somewhere else tomorrow. Before, there were lots of uh, um, permanent places where they would meet, but now you just meet up on Facebook or WhatsApp and you just uh, 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 agree to meet somewhere in the city. It depends. So the use of space is different. It's unexpected in places, on moments and in ways. Um, and you can see a few, few examples before Corona BC um uh, down below this is a, a church service in a park people get even baptized over here this is a sports club a meeting in a park because the park they were about uh, they were meeting normally is uh, used for a festival and this is what we see whenever the sun starts to shine parks get overcrowded and this has a lot to do with so social media because people can uh, meet very quickly. So the the, the law of uh, estate uh, agents location 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 is rapidly changing into reputation reputation reputation. Things can be uh, allocated uh, in places in the city that are really not very logic. But as long as your reputation on the uh, internet is really good, five stars, people will find you anyway. And COVID was, of course, a big accelerator. It's a big impact on the use of space for schools, for medical uh, uh, services. My doctor, you can also use, uh, you can uh, reach her uh, on, uh, uh, with, uh, digital means working at home not always much of a success if you ask me new apps that can uh, uh, pronounce and uh, where you can detect if it's crowded in the city local uh, SMEs that are really struggling to uh, survive because they have to compete with uh, international uh, things like Amazon and of course the big office res resets. 
we estimate that uh, uh, loads of, uh, of office spaces will be uh, uh, replaced by other functions because there will be uh, a decrease in office uh, use. So there's a lot going on in the cyber uh, uh, world that's uh, affecting the, the physical world as well. So we need to make the cyber part of our planning processes. And here's how we do it in Rotterdam, how we're exploring how to do this. We're, um, we, may, we're, um, uh, we added some new organizing principles for the space usage, adding 4 and 5D planning. I'll explain this. First, we have monofunctional permanent use. Uh, oh, sorry, this one. First one is monofunctional permanent use. Spatial planning in the two-dimensional space. Permanent allocation, defined functions in a fixed place. We all know this one. They're legally affirmed in a zoning plan. And they're based on these traditional planning indexes and settlement logic. This is really changing right now. So this is a bit tricky to, keep, uh, to hold on to. What we're really good at in Rotterdam is also in 3D, permanent, permanent multifunctional use. Stack, combine, and mix. Looking for a magic mix, that's what we do. Like this one. If we, this would have been a, a, a physical uh, conference, I would have loved to show this. This is our market uh, hall, with dwellings uh, around the marketplace, water squares, uh, sports facilities combined with childcare. This is, uh, well, it's that head office, but it's also a bar, production location, and a restaurant. Parks with uh, retail underneath. This is uh, housing and a circus school uh, in the, in the, uh, lower, on the lower levels. Student hotel with community services. And this one's just been recently uh, opened, uh, an, uh, a theater, library, and restaurant. If you combine these one really smartly, you can get a magic mix. Then we add 4D, the factor of time, multifunctional and temporary use, fixed locations, but alternating uses. And this one is really boosted by COVID as well. This is actually a really old principle about, well, maybe marketplaces or the fair once a year. You also use it in streets, where this is a pedestrian zone and you can uh, 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 do expedition from 6 to 11 and after a certain time it's also allowed for bicycles. But also in the city center, space that we normally use for cars, but few times a year also to uh, celebrate uh, Zomer Carnaval, a famous event in Rotterdam. Or sports fields, hockey fields that are used in winter when it's not used for ice rink, really popular as well, temporary, we, we get rid of it and then it's used for hockey again. Or on a small scale, uh, parking that in summer is transformed into terraces as parklets on very big scale COVID. We had thousands of these last year and this year again. And 5D is a bit strange one. No one, no one understands, but it's distribution to digital platforms, fixed functions, but changing locations. We all know them. Fixed function could be you, you need to sleep somewhere and Airbnb, you Type it in on your phone and you, they give you some locations. Also, INS is about uh, restaurants, office spaces, pos uh, uh, learning possibilities, education. We also uh, have uh, one for parking. So private parking is open for people to, uh, to park their cars and uh, private owners can make a lot of money with that. For sports, same, same story. You can see on your phone if you want to for example go on a yoga lesson you can you can go uh, take lessons at diverse clubs 
Um, and this one, we also um, uh, made a, a, a public version of. It's just been launched last week. This is also the, the public things we're doing. So our um, sports facilities, the municipal sports facilities, you can uh, rent. You, you can uh, type in on the internet if it's free and then you can rent it uh, and do your own thing in these uh, facilities when they're not used for other uh, uh, options. And last but not least, this used to be my office. I haven't been here for uh, uh, one and a half year now and probably won't be going there anymore uh, uh, after because um, we uh, uh, as, municipality, as a municipality will be uh, uh, working at the office uh, mostly uh, and distribute our uh, working spaces all over the city and not just concentrated in one such a big building. So it's changing a lot. And we need to add these dimensions to a planning process, 4D and 5D. But it also means something for our governance. So this 2D, we're, well, this is the standard, this is what we're uh, uh, used to. Uh, it's no longer business as usual. It's uh, an exception, more or less, of what it's going to be. Permanent monofunctional areas, you don't want to have too much of that. They should be reserved for spa uh, reserved space for noisy, risky, and smelly uh, uh, uses. And you, we should take care that there's enough uh, space for uh, childcare, medical, and other essential functions that sometimes uh, cannot pay a very high rents. So also within the city, you could use this 2D um, to avoid uh, rental prices going up because it if it has such a, a zoning destination, you cannot raise it too much. 3D is magic, magic mix. It doesn't fall from the sky. And sometimes we, uh, we don't do this uh, very smartly. So how do we create synergy? So, this is a, a place in the city center where we have a lot of uh, bars and restaurants. And I was also living above. That's not a very good combination, no synergy. How to stimulate combined land use and shared facilities and how, avoid these, how to avoid these bad combinations. 4D, it's about programming public space on a daily, weekly, monthly, a seasonal basis. It really looks a long time ago, by the way, <laughs> such a crowded uh, uh, place. Um, what we found out during uh, COVID is that closing down roads on Sunday or during events is a really good way to create more space. Um, this is something what, uh, that we did uh, during the pandemic, and but we're, uh, opting for making this permanent now. So not permanent closure, but on certain uh, times of the, of the week, closing roads for uh, uh, people going out, for example. And we're looking for how to stimulate uh, uh, changing uses in, by other parties. So uh, schools and the playgrounds, how to, to uh, use them also when the schools are closed after four o'clock sports facilities, parking lots, offices, and so on. And 5D is our uh, most uh, difficult one. The space as a service um, part. We're constantly monitoring the effects of this 5D space uh, distribution. And we uh, collaborate also with other cities. What we also did during uh, uh, COVID was experimenting with uh, local platforms to really support the local businesses because that was really, really hard for them. Um, I would like to leave it at this. So i get back to the screen. Am I back right now? Yes. Ik hoor je niet, Paul. Klopt dat? 
hoor jou niet. Ik kan hear you. Onderaan je scherm zit het microfoontje. Hey, well. Paul, uh, Paul, uh, please, uh, you see the the buttons below. This, um, okay, he's just refreshing the page. Let's see. If you're listening uh, to us, uh, Paul, you have to uh, unmute, clicking on the microphone button in the in the uh, navigation, but and the control buttons at the bottom of the screen. Paul, uh, so if you are if you are listening to us, please uh, you can unmute yourself by clicking on the control buttons in the in the microphone that is at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can also uh, plug uh, your headphones if you have set headphones. Maybe it's uh, the the hardware configuration. No, it just worked, so it's not that. Okay. It happened before. Maybe I can just answer a question I see in the chat. Um, you already mentioned that 4D and 5D are challenging for the administration. Well, that. <laughs> Correct. Do you have any ideas or experiences how to overcome this issue? Um, well, we used the, the, the four quadrants uh, also to get um, people to, to raise awareness that this is uh, something that's really happening. You, you cannot say, well, we don't do it. It's just, it's just taking, uh, taking place as we, as we go along. Um, and what we, um, uh, so getting familiar with it, uh, uh, and also trying, uh, to, uh, <laughs> some new face coming in, um, uh, to discuss what the, the effects could be for the, the things that we are responsible as, uh, uh, municipalities, like, um, schools where um, um, we've started the discussion how to uh, use school buildings also for other functions um, this is an old discussion and this is not very uh, uh, well accepted uh, sometimes because it's um, uh, for for the the owners of, of the the people who use the school buildings it's not very attractive um, but with new techniques like uh, digital keys and so you can just shut down some parts of the school and open up other parts like these uh, sporting facilities and by uh, exper experimenting with that uh, and getting to know what pros and cons etc um, it starts um, little by little to to uh, uh, be part of the 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 way we work as a municipality. Even kijken. Let's see if there are any other questions. Is there an order? Is 5D better or more efficient than 4D or better than 3D? No. These are four uh, strategies that uh, uh, are uh, can be next to each other. So what I've tried to explain is sometimes you need 2D and it, 
it's just uh, something uh, you every situation asks something else but you you extend your planning uh, palette hey there's a new one Juta. yeah I thought I, I take over from Paul shortly yeah. because we thought that in this uh, point in the discussion David also joins and maybe it's interesting you uh, put forward uh, how you work with these 5D components and it's something that we also saw in the scenarios that David yeah. presented so maybe David can reflect on what Marije showed us yes thank you um, I can combine it with one of the questions in the chat as well about the constraints with which people have to uh, deal um, it's not up to any individual citizen, of course, to do anything uh, they like. And there are constraints. And one of the constraints, for example, in the more digital version of the Netherlands, uh, the five, let's say the 5D version of the Netherlands that Marije uh, talked about. In that case, it's, um, let's just um, limit us to, to spatial planning. In that case, people will be part of the planning system as long as they are very active on social media and are very well skilled in terms of, let's say, digital skills. So they will be asked to vote, for example, for any temporal use on a real-time basis, or perhaps an algorithm will know where they were um, uh, in the previous week, so they are automatically selected to speak up, for, for example, for a change of function in certain location. This is a completely different way of uh, inviting or perhaps also prohibiting people to be part of the planning system. And this is just one example in, uh, in this bubble city or 5D uh, planning approach. And other constraints are um, very much part of the other uh, scenarios. Perhaps I could give one example. Let's see what would be a good example. Um, well, for example, currently in the Netherlands, we have the system of the uh, MKWA, uh, the, the cost benefits, the societal cost benefit analysis, it's called, I think, in English, which has, uh, by definition in the Netherlands, a national basis. So if we calculate, is, is a certain plan a good idea or not? So we calculate costs and benefits. It, it will add up on the national level. If we take the own neighborhood as a, a scenario into account, this whole system will change into um, a regional cost benefits, which means that people will be able to um, react or will be able to calculate on their regional scale. A completely different way of evaluating big investments. So then the constraint is more on the national and the, you allow people much more room for acting or, uh, or participating in, in, in decision making on the regional scale. So we did, uh, to also answer Jan Jelovit in the, in the chat a little bit, we worked with different constraints on different levels in all of the scenarios. Um, yeah, perhaps that's, uh, that's uh, kind of bridging from the 5D into the other scenarios a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting that from the scenario that you made, you already see the first test results, how it works in, in real life. From what Certainly, um, Marije, not coincidentally, highlighted what happened to us last year, <laughs> the pandemic. Um, we were met with a lot of skepsis on, the, uh, on, on our bubble city, let's say the 5D approach uh, of the 5D scenario. That will never happen. We have been talking about the death of distance for ages. It will not happen. And we were, not, we were hardly finished with our uh, yeah. studies. And then COVID-19 came along. And within a week or two weeks, we were all working at home. We were doing... We would never have done this conference probably online last year or one and a half years ago. <laughs> so we were catapulted in a future that we did not see coming. And we, oh, I think we did our best, but we also did, discovered a lot of drawbacks uh, in our uh, current system. Ah, Paul is also again. I'm back. <laughs> it's <We> just, back. <laughs> so on a different machine. Um, Third machine, I might add. The other one didn't want to give sound, and but this one works. It's the old one, so uh, good old technology still works best, uh, no doubt. <laughs> so um, then you take over the moderation from here, and I leave. 
Um, yeah, well, anyhow, I think uh, we should be going to the next uh, part of the session uh, because we're running out of time uh, quickly. Uh, I'm afraid I did not hear anything from uh, Marije at the moment. I gave the floor to you. Um, the whole machine crashed. So, uh, uh, but let's um, um, maybe for now um, uh, to uh, cut this off ab abruptly. Ask Yuta to uh, to be on stage to. Keep being on stage. Thanks for taking over for a moment. And please uh, give your pitch on uh, the Stad van de Toekomst uh, results. Yes, I'll shortly uh, present some um, results from the City of the Future uh, design uh, studio to you. And also uh, go into some theoretical notions because I'm here today from my position at the Chair of Urban Area Development, uh, Technical University of Delft. I'll share my screen. And then make it full screen. Do you see it not properly now, Paul? Can you? Here. I guess everything's fine. Um, what I want to uh, show you is how a design studio can contribute to internal, uh, uh, sorry, to integral urban development. And I'll um, illustrate uh, my pitch with um, design visions produced by the design teams of Tom Venhoeven and Robert Gauss, who are here and who will uh, take over after this pitch uh, and, and go more in depth in the, in the panel discussion afterwards. Next slide. The background of the design studio uh, we organized in uh, 2018 and after. We actually worked on it till uh, two, three months ago. Uh, was that uh, the TU Delft, the uh, Royal Institute of Dutch Architects the Research Department and the Delta Metropolis Association of Paul Gerritsen uh, initiated um, this uh, design studio. Uh, and the uh, five largest municipalities of the Netherlands uh, participated and also two of the uh, ministries uh, involved into the questions we, we, we looked into. Uh, there was an enormous network of experts and knowledge institutions um, that helped us uh, with input and with reflections along the way. And there were 10 multidisciplinary design teams consisting not only of the architects, landscape architects and uh, urbanists, but also of all kinds of experts that contributed to, to our search. Uh, this is a, just a to show you, uh, this is part of the network at the book presentation. It was amazing how many people joined, participated, wanted to think along and to to follow the 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 the, uh, the, the, the sessions we did, the workshops, and it was an enormous uh, building up of knowledge uh, throughout a year that we worked on the on the core study. Um, now back to, uh, to a little bit of theory. What can research by design do in urban planning and development? It can help you to gain insight into questions and re redefine them. You can find out that sometimes a question put forward is not the whole question or it's the wrong one or you have to widen or specificate. Um, Research by design can help you to understand systems at different scales. I will shortly in illustrate that also with the, with the findings. Um, it can help to offer glimpses of possible futures. It can help to facilitate collaborative learning within a horizontal context, because in design studios, you can keep a little bit of distance from the political realm and, and, and create some more freedom, freedom in, in space and thinking. It can inspire and connect stakeholders and processes, and it can develop a new language, language for the tasks at hand. I will shortly show you how that looks like. Um, and then one more theoretical uh, notion. Uh, this uh, scheme shows how in a design studio, um, working through different rounds, um, 
problems can be specified and solutions can be taken. What you see here is these sinus curves uh, always show uh, like around a cycle of knowledge development, combination of knowledge, choosing, implementing and designing, making drawings and discussing them. And after uh, the group of people involved, all these stakeholders, participants, designers, they, uh, they decide what comes out of one round of designing together, they, 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 they consolidate it. That's the, the, uh, the dot here at the end of, of, of one of these cycles. And in the next cycle, new uh, actors can come in, new information, new knowledge, but, oh, sorry, but it gets uh, more precise at the end of the next sinus. You already know much better wh wh where you are heading for. And, and, and so uh, working through different rounds and workshops, you get closer to where you want to be and plans get more feasible, but also they become more, uh, they, they get more, more support because the stakeholders, the municipalities, the investors, they understand better uh, what, what could, what the, the futures could, could be, and uh, municipalities can uh, find out what governance could be needed. So this is a scheme of showing you how uh, this process of the City of the Future um, design studio worked. There was a central question, which was, how can we integrate transitions into city planning? And how can we do that in an integral way? Then we had local questions. We are, uh, I will, uh, as an example, show you the case in Rotterdam Alexander, where Tom Fenhoef and Robert Gaus worked on. For Rotterdam Alexander, the local questions were much more specific. Um, in that case, um, the question was how a retail hub and infrastructure node could uh, become the heart of a local neighborhood and who make a, a, who, how to make a, a place with a regional attractivity also a place for people who lived around it. So um, the local questions were, were used to define criteria for design and that were the starting points for the visualizations of the design teams. Um, and those design visions that were developed, as I, I told you just before, uh, also showed what would be needed uh, in, in, in terms of governance and policy uh, and also in, in future research. And, and but, So you see it's a complex uh, network that, that uh, works on, 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 on complex issues. But if you really start looking into what is it design can do, then it becomes much more clear. So here is the case study. Uh, on the left, you see the square kilometer uh, of urban fabric we looked at. It's dominated by a highway, a railway, a station, and it's characterized by oversized public space used for retail and for car facilities. Here you see how collaborative learning looks like in workshops, how stakeholders are uh, getting inspired, get to know each other better, and also get more interested in collaboration. This is the first um, slide of the team of uh, Team CM21 of Ton Fenhoeven. Um, the team started with an analysis of the modernist neighborhood that was uh, uh, the, the given uh, situation and came to the conclusion that uh, it was necessary to change uh, the area from a mo monofunctional place where traffic, uh, work, uh, nature and water system were all separated. So they proposed an integral system that connects the different scales. They uh, started with this range of smallest scale of the household, then you have the neighborhood life, the sta station biotope, and the metropolitan landscape. And what they said is every topic you address, you try to solve it on the lowest scale level. And, to, um, and for that, they also um, introduced a tool that I show you on the next slide where a new language also was introduced. They, 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 uh, the team uh, thought of introducing a vicinity label so that every um, product, but also every 
uh, surface that comes from this neighborhood can be labeled. Is it from close by or does it come from very far? And by uh, also uh, making the, 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 the vicinity more uh, important and more, uh, like David Hamas also said before, in his, his, his neighborhood scenario, by enhancing the importance of the vicinity, you create, uh, you, 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 you give way to local services and you create stepping stones to, towards self-sufficiency in, in a neighborhood. So um, by redefining a modernist neighborhood, like on, you see on, on the scheme on the, on the left side, into a neighborhood as a 15 minute system where everything is in walking distance and everything is close by, you see how uh, this Rotterdam Alexander neighborhood could become a place where, where local economy and quality of life can flourish. So this is how that could look like. And what is this is the, the, the uh, design vision for the station biotope. And what is striking about this is that the crossover between infrastructure and the biotope is a possible uh, direction, it can be done. And it shows that the intensification, mobility, and a sustainable uh, environment are no contradiction. So here, uh, a couple of uh, important insights that were created. On the left side, you see um, what, uh, how in the old ways uh, the, the, uh, there was being dealt with urban planning, like um, a homogeneous um, urban fabric that uh, on the right side of the green arrows, you see what it could be in the future. It could be a various environment or uh, that shopping and owning could become an environment of sharing and experiencing. So transforming this uh, modernist neighborhood into a more future-proof uh, system is actually what uh, this design team showed. Um, here, this is the last slide of this uh, design vision. Uh, here you also have a glimpse of a possible future, uh, the high quality uh, surrounding that is uh, working not only for people, but, only, but also for animals and plants. Then the other design vision uh, from the team of Robert Huys, uh, Flox, they started with an analysis of the public space and found out that there was an enormous oversize uh, between, oh, sorry, I wanted to point something out, um, between the monofunctional islands, there are these zippers, these uh, vast amounts of public space that the team uses as a zipper to fix the neighborhoods together and to, uh, in the moment you zip them together, they can start interacting. So then what happens in these zipper uh, zones? Here you see a, a road of 90 meters wide where the team introduces new construction. From out of one road, you can basically make four. And here you have what Maraya actually uh, presented in her presentation, the stack combine and mix strategy. This is uh, how you can fill up the oversized public space with amenities uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, and the team also introduced new typologies that are actually also old typologies that have where you can find this inspiration uh, from how it was done in the 17th century. This is actually the, the typology of an old merchant house, a traditional, a traditional Dutch typology for a multifunctional use where on every floor something else could happen, living, uh, stacking goods, uh, office space for merchants, etc. Also manufacturing. Um, so uh, by introducing these concepts that facilitate mixed use and interaction, also new types of economy can emerge. Then here you have another um, of these uh, uh, redefinitions of, of, of space and, and, and the questions. The main road is a car uh, uh, is a car space now, but by uh, making redefining it into a free profile for smart mobility systems, as you see below, you can um, you can generate a strip 
where new functions can be added also and experimentation and interaction can take place. And then the third cross section that I wanted to show you from that plan is also how you redefine a place that is uh, now um, taken by, by traffic and by, by parking, how you can uh, use public space as the base for spatial quality by um, making it into a water square it will, it will actually strengthen the area's identity. And this is how the team put it in, in an iconic um, way, how you can make the public space the base for spatial quality, not only on this square, but for the whole uh, area. And um, actually, if you uh, use a, this, a notion like this as a starting point, you connect stakeholders and 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 um, you you offer them an offer they can't refuse. Basically, um, this is a glimpse into the possible future. Then, where you see how this public space uh, could be transformed, and that's basically the end of my um, presentation. Because from here on, here uh, I want to show you. The, the, the publication, The City of the Future, which is also English, where you can find it. But from here on, I will stop sharing my screen because now Tom and Robert have to come in. Yes, please. Uh, so thank you very much, Jutta. Please uh, stay on board. And uh, Robert and Tom, maybe you can join the conversation. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, so it would be good to reflect a little bit on uh, on, on all of these uh, parts of the puzzle. Uh, and um, and I, I would like to start with a question that I often ask myself. Um, there's no second to lose almost, so particularly when you dive into all of the different studies that are dealing with uh, pressing matters of climate change, energy transition, and, uh, and uh, ecosystem collapse that we are facing we're faced with, on top of all of these more political questions like like uh, affordable housing, uh, social social justice, etc., etc., etc. Are we not wasting time with these kind of studies, uh, or do we get some change, or do we gain some some traction on change uh, in in a wider society? And maybe I want to start with Tom uh, with your uh, sort of. A long experience also with advising the government. How do you see this uh, question? No, I, I see that uh, there is a very strong focus on the, um, uh, for example, the lawsuit against Shell, uh, that they have to reduce the CO2 emissions. And um, then there is a lot of med media attention for self-driving cars. So it seems like society is, is aware that something needs to change, but uh, they cannot make the, um, uh, the really important uh, steps. So uh, we, we have a lot of um, headwind with um, uh, planning the position for uh, windmills. Um, solar comes from, uh, uh, from the wrong province in uh, China. Um, so, for me, it's very clear that uh, when you cannot solve one issue first, let's say the issue of the CO2 emissions, uh, and then tackle the uh, biodiversity crisis, and then tackle the, um, the seawater uh, sea level rise, you have to do it all at once in the next 10 years. And what we try to do is, uh, as designers, we can be very opportunistic. We're, we're looking for solutions, not uh, scenarios. So one of the solutions that I was looking for is uh, I grabbed the opportunity, and my team grabbed the opportunity to say, okay, um, we need to come with solutions. And uh, we have to think uh, from, from the basis. As, let's say, uh, 100 years ago, the constructivists in uh, Russia did, uh, like the people from the Bauhaus did, 
now we're in a new century, we have new challenges, and we have to uh, reinvent our profession. Yeah. And that's, yeah. um, that's why we combined all these uh, elements of traffic uh, yeah. with uh, the water management issue. Uh, this polder in Rotterdam is six meters below sea level, current sea level, so in the future it will be more, uh, maybe nine meters. Um, so we have to come up with all these solutions. And uh, doing that, we discovered uh, lots of things. You can actually uh, uh, create win-win situations when you create alternative solutions for traffic, combine that with uh, much more uh, room for green in the city uh, and repairing ecosystems and at the same time uh, improve the quality of life in the city. Yeah. So this is um, hopefully inspiration for other people to uh, that do all the planning. Yeah, so find, find in this combination in adding sort of complexities to each other solutions that can actually create some, some uh, change. But still, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Robert, maybe you can answer that. What happened uh, after the study? Uh, what, what happened to, to the results? Did something uh, change in uh, Alexander Polar? Well, I, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, the, the study is now uh, three years old. And I think every time then when, when I'm um, uh, like uh, in a conversation like this or, or, or re-looking at what we did with the study or reusing it for a project or what else, uh, it becomes more and more a uh, logic way of thinking like combining all those different kind of uh, uh, questions and I, I also find out that uh, uh, when you like when you literally pile on more demands in your design you also make a much more uh, a solution that's much more exciting than if you pile just only on on on, on, on single demands so um, yeah I think um, what we learned ourselves is that Actually, it's a benefit also to co combine all those different uh, questions uh, according to climate change or uh, mobility, what else? Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, what, what, I, what I found also, I think what's really interesting, actually, the, the, the moment that I thought of that again, like the, the, the study is like three years old and, and we're now like sort of going to a new era that, that uh, 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 makes us aware of all those things is that uh, what David says, like th that we, we have this context of deep uncertainty. I think, I think that it was also very much the start of the, of the design process at that time, eh? how to design for this deep uncertainty. So also with our team, we, we came uh, uh, quite soon in the process with the, this thing. 0, 0.0 maybe the city you should make uh, a design a basic design you should design the t-shirt uh, of the outfit uh, that should be a very good t-shirt and then from there uh, it can develop it can be developed in different ways and maybe all those scenarios can also find places in in our cities yeah so very similar position as uh, as what tom just explained yeah in, in sort of re re-establishing re re a new kind of thinking uh, as, ha as happened uh, in the beginning of last century. Maybe uh, Marije and uh, David can come in as well. Uh, why not? Because uh, I'm, I'm curious, Marije, I, I, I remember quite well when we first uh, uh, rang your doorbell, uh, you and me, uh, to, to, to discuss about the possibility of taking uh, also Alexander Polder as, uh, as a case study. And you said, well, there's so much to be done and it's really mind boggling how much is going on and we're all overworked in City Hall. And, uh, but still, yes, let's do this because I think it's, uh, it's important. Uh, uh, otherwise, we will never come up with solutions that will help us uh, in the future. We need to do uh, this kind of uh, work. Uh, do you still feel like that? Do you think uh, that was a wise decision? Definitely, because it's what Ton also refers to. It's about integrating all these different demands, and Robert also told, told it. And that's what's, uh, what's changing also our, our perspective. So, and what you thought, uh, told that there's a new language that's developed 
how to even look at all these um, different uh, challenges. And we, uh, we, it starts to, well, three years is a long time, but for urban planets is really, really short. So it really starts to uh, get into our system right now. So we're working on the Alexander land. Biodiversity is a really big topic. It was one of the first studies that really addressed it in an integrated way. And this is now, uh, we just uh, adopted a, a biodiversity pol policy as a city. We, we never had that. It was something for the outskirts and, and our, uh, the, the, the agriculture land around them. But it's also a city thing. That's what, what Ton also showed, that you can integrate it in the city. Things like that, they change the minds. And if you don't change how you think, you never get it done. That's yeah. what these kind of studies do. So it, re it really helps. It just it takes time. It's not tomorrow. No, no. So we, even though we're all so busy in the here and now and, and fixing all kinds of things, it's really important to create a, 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 a an arena where this kind of thinking can yeah. uh, can happen. Um, and and I'm curious about how how the corona. Uh, pandemic uh, was a game changer in, in that. Maybe David, can you reflect a little bit on that? Because I'm I'm also thinking of this, I, I still remember when you presented for the first time uh, the scenarios, I, I all thought them to be indeed quite uh, uh, far-fetched and uh, well, maybe on the, on the border of what was uh, uh, achievable, but then suddenly I realized it's not actually. Uh, did you experience that also while uh, while being on tour? Probably most of it uh, virtually. Yes, yes, we did experience this. Um, we we met a lot of let's say, uh, well, first of all, hospitality that we could come, but also resistance to ideas that seemed far fetched. Uh, for example, uh, being digital, becoming a digital being. Uh, and we have been digital beings now for one and a half years, and no one saw it coming. Um, this, I think, should be a, a, an alarm clock going off uh, because we are facing much more uh, complicated issues uh, that uh, Tom uh, also mentioned, climate change, biodiversity issues, and Utah as well. Um, we should, I think, resist carving up uh, issues looking for yeah. the clear well delineated opportunities and solutions and that that is kind of uh, from for me acting in a, a scientific community that's the the default option by a lot of from a lot of my colleagues carving up getting a grip on things controlling things i think tom uh, just made a plea for adding complexity um taking a, a kind of a multi-layered approach, which makes it much more difficult, but which also has the benefit of uh, introducing novel perspectives that we perhaps could not think of if we would have just stayed within our territories. And um, the, the, the design community is much more, much better equipped to do this than a lot of uh, my scholarly or scientific colleagues. So, yeah, so, so I think we also learned a lot by, by uh, visiting all the organizations that invited us because they were also sometimes much more creative and much more courageous than uh, a lot of scientists. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I, I uh, recently heard, I think a couple of days ago, it was uh, Dirk Simons uh, who, who made a plea to, uh, to add another uh, layer of scientific research. Uh, so uh, not only have induction and deduction, but also abduction, as he called it. Uh, abduction meaning the, the power of research by design in, in terms of capturing the imagination and, 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 and making uh, things uh, seem, vis seem possible that, that before that were not. Uh, Gijske has a has a, a question in the chat, and, and I wonder if uh, if Jutta can uh, react on that. But it, because basically it it combines with this uh, question, like we are now doing this in a kind of safe space that uh, that, that Maria, for instance, created in in order to allow this kind of thinking. She already said a lot of changes happening immediately after that because we're well, we're we are looking for these kind of answers, but she's asking uh, how to 
how to take adaptivity and, and, the, and the social aspect, including uh, citizens in this process, also more uh, for real, let's say, in the here and now. How do you look at that? Can, 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 we, um, can we position the research by design method also more in society? Would that work out? What do you think? Yes, I think that is moving more towards participation also because uh, the research by design method as it worked for the last 20, 30 years in the Netherlands was actually an expert uh, tool. But nowadays we also see the uh, inhabitants of an area as experts. So there is no difference between that. It is important that the experts from a municipality are in those workshops, but in Rotterdam Alexander, actually, in the workshops we held, we had these people from the neighborhood who were um, unified in a, uh, in a, in a vereniging, what is that in English? Association? An association, yeah, uh, that were actually also uh, fighting for for a better uh, they already had a platform so it is not I think the only thing um, we have to acknowledge is that there is no difference between the knowledge of an expert and the knowledge of someone who is an expert in living in a neighborhood and by uh, making these uh, the 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 knowledge wider, you also get the better input for your for visualizing the possible futures. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe because we have to. Sorry, Maria, please. Oh, what what you um, uh, just said? We're using that now. Also, I hear Yes. Design uh, design thinking tools or. Um, with, with communities. I'm, I'm also curious uh, uh, how, uh, how Robert and Tom experiences uh, is in that respect, like in all other kinds of uh, work you're doing. Do you see a change happening there or not? Well, I think, yeah, I think what is very important uh, to make a distinction, uh, I, the graph that uh, Utah showed of the entire process where you have different actors coming in the design process at different times, uh, I think it's a very uh, useful visualization of uh, what actually happens. Because um, I think in the beginning of the, of the process, you can have participation in terms of what would you like, what, uh, what kinds of things would you like once we tackle uh, the future of your uh, community. But uh, thinking about how to achieve that is also a technical uh, issue. Like, uh, what do we have to do with the traffic? Uh, which, uh, which switches uh, can we manipulate to change the, uh, the future of this uh, neighborhood? What I experienced in the um, Rotterdam Alexander case is that we started off with a transit-oriented development approach uh, based on the assumption that uh, walking and cycling is much better. And then uh, what helped me a lot were the master classes and, and, uh, um, and the uh, presentations uh, with, uh, with the entire teams. Um, I was um, tackled by an expert from the water board uh, and uh, she said to me that uh, we overlooked the water management issue of Rotterdam Alexander. And in a normal commission, I wouldn't have uh, experienced some, something like that because uh, you get a commission because of a tender and then you have the project managers that, that uh, control uh, your research. And now in this uh, exercise, uh, we could follow up and uh, said, okay, we want to solve the issues of the water management, but you need to give us the best experts we have in the Netherlands. And that's how we came up with all kinds of solutions. And with the best experts of SWICO on uh, traffic um, uh, consultancy, we could yeah. decide that we could get rid of one major road. 
So these, these things are very important also on an expert level. Yeah, so that's really the, the, the process of working. Um, I think it's also fair to say we can continue on that line for, uh, for a very long time, but indeed, as Daniel was saying in the chat, the time's up. Uh, but um, it's, can I, can I think, very important. Sorry, can I add one thing? Yeah. Uh, because so what, 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 what I really believe is that I, I really believe in this 5D of Marije. I think that's the, 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 the part where also participation can have a very, very important role in the city. And I really believe that we need to design cities in a way that people feel and have the opportunity to make it their own city. And I think this digitalization will very much help that. That's a promise, yeah. Good. Um, um, I'm afraid my... Uh, uh, my connection is again breaking down. I don't know what, what it is actually. It's a, um, I've never experienced something like this. Probably it's just. Yeah, don't 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 it tells you to stop. <laughs> it tells you to shut up. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it tells me to, to not wrap up. So I would like to thank all of you and, 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 and I hope to see you all very soon. Yes, uh, inside this yes. panel. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will for sure uh, soon see each other live and uh, and hopefully also some people who attended this, mission, uh, this session very thank you very much and uh, hope to see you thank somewhere you. else soon so thank you very much